Welcome to State of Mind. Being human and living well. 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 I'm the producer, Deborah Sloss, licensed marriage and family therapist, and I go by she, her pronouns. Today, we have a very special episode for you that is about teen mental health, but specifically, we're focusing on how teens can support their peers through education, community building, and advocacy. And this episode is unique in that it's been created by teens, hosted by teens, and made specifically for their teen peers. So I'm excited to introduce you to our guest host for today, 17-year-old Niku, who reached out to me, suggested the idea for today's show, and has shaped the development of the concepts that are going to be discussed today. Making this episode presented some extra challenges. Just getting these five very busy teens together at the same time was a feat in itself. We also recorded this interview remotely and ran into some technical issues that compromised some of the sound quality. But what each of these thoughtful teens has to say is so important that I encourage you to stick with us and hear them out. I promise you'll learn something from them. Behind Niku Sederat's kind and gentle nature, there's a powerhouse, and through her own mental health advocacy work, she's already having a significant impact on her community and beyond. Niku is a senior in high school whose passion lies in enhancing the mental well-being of youth and their communities. She is the founder and executive director of UNITE, a youth mental health organization dedicated to reducing mental health stigma and enhancing emotional resilience in youth. The author and publisher of two youth-based psychoeducational books and the host of her own mental health podcast, Unity Mental Health. Having seen the toll of the mental health crisis on her peers, loved ones, and overall community, Niku has become dedicated to combating this crisis through a community-centric approach, drawing upon compassion, research, and lived experience as guideposts. Welcome, Niku. Thank you, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here and talk about a communal issue that I am so passionate about. Personally, I see a lot of value in opening up the conversation about mental health. To me, mental health advocacy does not always have to be through mediums like my organization, Unite, or through my mental health books. It can also look like informing ourselves personally about mental health, lending a compassionate shoulder to a friend, or engaging in school clubs and programs, like many of our guests today. Regardless of how we take action, amid a youth mental health crisis, the urgency for sparking mental health change has never been more important. U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has warned that a youth mental health crisis is already brewing. Startling statistics from the CDC reveal that more than one in five youth grapple with serious mental illnesses at some point in their lives. We've repeatedly heard these statistics, but it's time that we make change. And as an avid youth mental health advocate, I hope to be that change. I'm also so excited to be speaking to a group of youth who are also taking action. Here with me today are not only four passionate youth, but also a vibrant community that represents the power of youth empowerment. Marley Miller from Salinas High, Melissa Macias from North Monterey High School, Oscar Alvarez Delgado from Pajaro Valley High School, and Devin Bloom from Scotts Valley High are all here with me to speak on mental health and come together to bring the youth perspective to this rising youth crisis. Welcome Marley, Melissa, Oscar, and Devin to State of Mind. Thank you for being here with us today. Happy to be here. Thanks, happy to be here. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Thank you. Let's meet and learn more about our guests each in turn. Marley Miller is a junior at Selena's High School and is on the school's cheer team. Marley has been an active participant in advocating for the betterment of teen mental health since 2018. She is a member of the AIM Youth Mental Health Research Program and has participated in multiple scientific symposiums regarding the topic of teen mental health. 
Her main goal as an advocate is to give teens a voice in a subject that directly impacts them. She believes that if you don't consult those who the solution affects, the solution will never be effective. Marley, on a personal level, what does mental health mean to you and why is it so important? Um, Mental health to me is just a state of being and everyone goes through mental health. Um, It doesn't necessarily have to be a negative concept. And I think that that's a really big misconception. So to me, mental health is just how you're feeling on a day to day basis and is something that impacts everyone, regardless of your emotions that you're going through. And I think it's really important that everyone understands that everyone goes through it so that it helps break down a stigma around mental health and that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Thank you so much for that. I totally agree with you, Marley. Tell me a little bit more about your work in the mental health space. How are you involved? Yeah, so I'm involved in a program called AIM Youth Mental Health, and it's a research program where we develop surveys, field them, take in the results, synthesize our data, and then present our research at symposiums and in high school classroom environments. And we go through and we look at statistics of how many teens are affected in our county, and then what they're affected with in the mental health area, what they're struggling with and what they think solutions would be and kind of combine them all into solutions so that we can help. That sounds wonderful and it seems like it's a very youth-centric program which speaks to the importance of involving youth in this crisis. The next guest is Melissa who is currently a senior at North Monterey County High School. She is an uprising teenager in the advocacy for youth mental health and also an aspiring medical provider. She has been a part of AIM Youth Mental Health Research Labs and Symposiums and has been affiliated with Safe Space, a youth-led organization working towards youth mental health, both participating in panels and short films. She is also a self-creator of the Positive Mental Attitude PMA Club at her school, opening up the conversations about mental health with her peers. Melissa has also been through her own journey of mental health challenges, which began when she was the age of 12. She has recently recovered and is sharing her story to further advocate against the stigma of mental illness and systemic failures she saw for both herself and her peers around access to mental health. Welcome, Melissa. On a personal level, what does mental health mean to you and why is it so important? Hi. So mental health for me is just something that we all go through, like Marley said. I think it really is important to take care of. And also, it's something that really strengthens you in your life, as usually it's something that we always put behind us because we're always trying to get ahead in our work, in our studies, when in reality, all of our creativity and all of our being of who we are comes from our mental space of how we take care of ourselves, how we treat ourselves, because it reflects on how we treat others and how we go about through life in a positive or negative way. So I think it's a really beautiful thing to kind of learn about yourself and strengthen yourself. Thank you so much. That's such a wonderful answer. I think so many times we associate mental health with weakness when in reality, it's such a source of strength and creativity, like you mentioned. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you're involved in the mental health space, Melissa? Yeah, so it kind of happened by accident. I mean, I had my own journey and I decided that instead of making it something negative in my life to make it something positive. So I decided to share my story and I came into AIM, the organization, and it's really, really cool. It works with a lot of different schools around our county and it's now expanding to other counties, just a youth led uh, research that you know panels and uh, surveys different schools Um, I'm also involved with safe space because of AIM they invited me to do panels as well and they're a really cool organization also in my own school level I have a little club that I run um, that's kind of like a mental health club but yeah I'm constantly trying to look for new places to volunteer at and share my story. Thank you so much, and I'm so happy that you're here sharing your story today. 
Our next guest is Oscar Alvarez Delgado, who was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, and at just three months old was brought to Watsonville, California, where he's lived since and where he has made school his primary focus. At the start of 2023, Oscar started feeling tremendous anxiety and loneliness and felt his only worth was determined by his school performance performance. He was able to come through that difficult period and rebounded with the help of a supportive sibling and friends that were there for him when he needed it the most. At the start of his senior year, Oscar was chosen as the student trustee for Santa Cruz County School Board and had the opportunity to join the Youth Mental Health Leadership Council and Youth for Environmental Action as a new advocate for mental health and the environment. Thank you so much for being here, Oscar. On a personal level, what does mental health mean to you and why is it such an important topic? What is most important to me is finding peace within yourselves because we forget about ourselves when we're there trying to please others, such as our parents who have very high expectations for us, but understandably through their own efforts that I am here. Mental health for me is being there for people that need you and are too afraid to go out for you to look for, to go for help. So for me, it's very much about a peace of mind, finding peace within yourself and being able to live comfortably within yourself without having to feel the judgment or anxiety of others. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love how you reference mental health to be something that's not only empowering for you, but also something that empowers you to then uplift others and support their mental health. That's a really wonderful sentiment. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you're involved in the mental health sector, Oscar? I joined the Men Youth Mental Health Council as a way to find, to find others to relate to, but also be able to push forward. And with the Youth Leadership Mental Health Council. Uh, we are also planning on creating presentations to give to kids elementary and up to find support for them and what it means to have find good and what defines good and bad relationships, especially early on in their, in their childhood. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Our next guest is Devin Bloom, who is 16 years old and he's a sophomore at Scotts Valley High. He's a member of the Hope Squad, a peer-to-peer -peer mental health support club at his school. He makes it his goal to help people struggling with mental health issues and to learn more about it through his experience as a member. Some of Devin's passions are playing guitar and cooking as well. Thank you so much for being here, Devin. Can you tell me a little bit about what mental health means to you and why it's such an important topic for you as well as youth in general? Yeah, so to me, mental health is, it's really just like the condition of your mind, right? But it's so important that we acknowledge it because unlike uh, your physical health, you can't, you can't see mental health, right? It's very easy to see when someone's sick, but you can't tell when someone's uh, going through something mentally. So that's why it's uh, so important that uh, we learn about it in school and stuff like that. It's important to me too, specifically, because I've seen so many people in my life struggle with uh, different problems with their mental health and stuff like that. That's part of the reason why I went into Hope Squad. It's because I just wanted, I wanted to learn more about this topic because I wasn't sure how to help those people in my life. Wonderful. It's so amazing that you're really trying to lend a compassionate shoulder for those around you. I'm wondering, can you tell me a little bit more about your involvement in the mental health space, Devin? Yeah, so I was skeptical of Hope Squad before I went into it. I was, I wasn't super interested, but I got voted in by some of my peers, and I decided to start going to the meetings. I had already previously been interested in mental health and stuff like that. It had been a part of my life, but I wasn't super interested in the organization itself. But as I started going to the meetings, it sort of fanned the flame, and I realized that it was, it was more. It just made me more and more inter interested in the whole topic, and it. I saw how I could help the people around me and I could saw how I could saw how I could just help my peers in general and help myself. So that's kind of the basis for my involvement. Thank you so much for sharing, Devin. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about mental health, loneliness, and other issues affecting youth. Oftentimes, mental health challenges are seen as highly individualistic issues. 
But research shows that many mental health challenges arise due to a combination of biological, social, and psychological factors. Marley, what are some of the social factors that you think are currently impacting the rising mental health crisis in youth? Yeah, definitely. So some of the social factors that I think are currently impacting rising mental health crisis are social media and stigma. I'm a really big advocate around social media in the sense that a lot of the time people think of social media as a complete negative and that it's just a platform where you compare yourself to other people. And I'm a really big advocate for using it in a positive light where you get positive quotes on the daily or you can listen to poetry and podcasts and get beautiful things out of things that are normally taken with a negative light just finding a positive and something that's typically considered a negative, especially in the teen community. And then another factor that I think is really big, especially in teens today, is stigma. A lot of people think that they're alone in their problems. And then if they want to reach out for help, fear that there's someone that's going to judge them for it. And it's a really big outside factor impacting teens. So just trying to help break down that stigma and let everyone know that you're not alone and all of us go through it and we all have those days, so. Yeah, that's a great point. I think both stigma and social media have huge, huge impacts on our mental health and well-being. Moving on to you, Devin, I'm wondering, you do a lot of great work um, in you're a member of your school's Hope Squad. What do you think are some needs or things that need to be changed in terms of mental health support for youth? Most people who are struggling, I feel just need like somebody to confine their problems with. And sometimes a lot, a lot of people who are struggling don't feel like they have somebody who could, they can talk to at home or they don't have a friend who they feel comfortable talking with at school. So I think that's the reason why we have school counselors and stuff like that. Like, but I I think a lot, a lot of people just aren't comfortable with that and brings it back to uh, why I think home squad is so important. I think it's just so important to have, um, like peers who are out there to uh, support people who feel very alone with um, their mental health. And it's a cycle too, right? Like you feel lonely, it makes your mental health worse. And then you have nobody to talk to. So it's, it's a cycle and it, you need people who are um, ready to help those people who don't, who feel alone with their struggle. Yes, totally. I think you touched on the need for reaching out and the importance of reaching out when you're struggling, but also the feelings of loneliness that are so prevalent in youth. And I think that's only amplified due to the stigma that Marley touched upon. So while talking about this show with you earlier on, it came up that you see your male peers being much less likely to seek help and having a harder time even talking with a friend about their mental health challenges. Devin, could you share some of your experiences with that? What does that look like for you and and your surrounding community? Yeah, so it's kind of like the stigma that Marley was talking about. Uh, I feel that there's a very big stigma uh, around men in general having uh, talking about their mental health and their feelings and things like that. I've had many of my female peers like come up to me and like voice um, how, how they're struggling, uh, things like that. The only uh, male peer I've ever had like speak to me about his mental health. He was a, he was a very close friend of mine and we, we'd we been friends for, for friends for probably at least like, like six years or something like that. And he spoke to me about the fact that he was really struggling. He felt really depressed and he felt very lonely and it was really interesting to hear him talk to me because I, I had never had this experience before. I never had one of my male friends come up and talk to me and I, I listened and we had a whole conversation about it. And I just, I was really proud of him. Honestly, I don't know if I would have been, I don't know if I would have the courage to speak to one of my other male peers. Cause it's just like, it's just not, even with some of your closest friends, I mean, of course it's just my experience, but I feel that there's a lot of men out there who just don't feel comfortable talking about stuff like that, even to other guys who they're very, very close with. Yeah, I hear you. I think the stigma is very much prevalent in some groups more than others. Many of us live and work in spaces where mental health is stigmatized due to a multitude of both social and cultural factors.
This is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. In case you're just joining us, I'm your guest host, Niku Sadarat, and we're talking about the current state of teen mental health and about youth-driven mental health support and advocacy. With me today for this conversation are four passionate teens, Marley Miller from Salinas High, Melissa Macias from North Monterey High School, Oscar Alvarez Delgado from Pajaro Valley High School, and Devin Bloom from Scotts Valley High. Listeners of today's show may also want to check out episode 34 titled Suicide Prevention for Teens and Young Adults. That and many other episodes can be found in the archives at www.stateofmindmedia.org. Stay with us and we'll be right back after this brief message from our underwriter. Back to our interview. Melissa, what are some of the biggest barriers to good mental health and barriers to mental health support that you see teens facing in your community? Sure. So I think one of the biggest things that I see is that there's not enough representation in mental health. And I say that because there's a lot of people nowadays coming up and talking about mental health because it's a more open uh, topic and sometimes it's a more open issue. Um, But The thing with mental health is that not everybody is going to relate to one voice. I think we all relate to somebody that we look like, that we have the same background as, maybe the same ethnicity as, and one voice is not enough to to, um, reach everybody. So I think it's really important for different ethnicities, different races to come and start speaking about it because you could really just help connect with one person that has never seen themselves in a space with mental health, talking about it. And I think that's important because it could really reach the lives of those who are still stuck, not seeing themselves as a representation. That's a wonderful point. I think you touched on culture, which is so valuable when we experience mental health. It definitely impacts the way in which we experience that. I'm drawn to what you're saying because I think I resonate it with it as well. I feel that it would just be so impactful if I had someone there who understood me and understood what I was going through um, when experiencing mental health challenges that also just happened to look like me as well. I understand that you also have some ideas about what your peers really need in order to, to be able to access mental health support. Can you share a little bit about that with us? Sure. I think a lot of what students need is service workers actually serving. And I know that it sounds a little weird to say, but a lot of these school counselors and a lot of these people who put themselves in a position to help students aren't necessarily fully active and present when they are helping these kids. And I say that as like a personal example of mine, my father recently passed away and it was something really really heavy on me I wasn't planning on getting help but a counselor actually she was an academic advisor at my school uh, who wasn't even a a counselor a therapist reached out to me uh, in an email and she said you know I know of your passing but I just want to make uh, make you aware that I'm here if you need anything if you need somebody to talk to you know my name you know my room coming at any time that you need to and I'm, and I'm very sorry for your loss. And I thought that was something so beautiful because even though I wasn't thinking about getting that help, it made me know that somebody was listening to me and somebody was present and aware that I was maybe struggling and they introduced themselves to me. So if I really did have a problem, I could confide in somebody that was already there for me. Well, most students nowadays don't even know their counselor, don't know where their room is, nor have no idea who they are. So I think these service workers should come out and present themselves, engage with students. So if something ever happens, they know who you are, they know where you are, and they confide in you before saying something very critical about their lives. 
Thank you so much for sharing your story, Melissa. It sounds like that one teacher who reached out was really a powerful figure and it really all it takes is someone to just be there serving and present. As an avid mental health advocate myself, I truly believe that the universality of mental health lends itself to bringing people together. I encourage everyone listening to take action towards starting conversations about mental health with your friends, family, loved ones, and the adults in your life. The more we speak about these rising challenges, the closer we can get to destigmatizing these mental health topics and fostering important partnerships between teens and adults in order to create healthy communities of compassion and happiness. Oscar, as a student trustee, you have a direct line of communication with your county board of education. What, if anything, do you see changing as a result of that? But it's most hard for me. I can't say that I've seen any change because it is very hard for me to bring up mental health at the board meetings. I don't know what it is, but it, it maybe it's when I'm in the room and I'm looking around at all the other trustees. I feel as maybe a sense of judgment when I know I shouldn't. The board meeting, these people around the trustees are a safe place. But to me, it still feels like maybe very judgmental when it shouldn't be. It is really just for me a stepping stone in order to, to get over that barrier of bringing up mental health within the board meetings and just seeing the general mental health of Santa Cruz County, I think. Thank you so much for sharing that and being vulnerable. I think that's a totally valid feeling. And sometimes as youth, talking to adults about issues that are historically stigmatized can be really difficult. Melissa, I also understand that you have presented information about your AIM Youth Research Project to your school board and also at a conference attended by many mental health professionals and educators. What impact do you think this has had and what, if anything, do you see changing as a result of it? Sure, so for the conference, I was there with Marley at the AIM panel. I felt like it was such a really beautiful and safe space where a lot of people who were actually interested in mental health and in youth mental health specifically really got to hear a lot of our natural voices just kind of speaking how we feel, nothing scripted. So I, I think they really got a hold of, of how we're feeling and the, and the problems that we're going through. Um, they also got the opportunity to ask questions to us, uh, which was really cool because, I mean, we're not professionals. We simply just kind of live the lives that we had. And it's amazing to see that people are interested in that. So I think that was a really beautiful experience. Towards my school, I don't really believe we made a lot of change. I think it was just something that was on their like board meeting agenda. I'm not going to lie. I presented, but it was very quick. I only had five minutes. Everybody kind of looked a little bit uh, stressed, uh, just kind of making me go through it kind of quickly. Uh, I do believe that some of them actually do care about mental health, but I, I haven't really heard any of them reach back or ask like, hey, you know, what can we do? I think that's just more of a personal type of school re relation. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to to get it more on a local level but I think if it's more of a big organization like AIM where people are willing to hear you I think it's a really beautiful experience. I agree I had a similar experience I did a presentation with a couple other Hope Squad members to the school board in Scotts Valley and I felt the similar similar response uh, from the people listening as in like it's basically what you said. I felt like some people were listening. Some people weren't listening as much, but there hasn't been much response, you know? Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I think what's most important, first of all, is that you guys are both taking active steps to open the conversation. That in of itself is super important. And going back to what Melissa said, you mentioned that we might not be mental health professionals, but it is completely true that we're professionals of our own lives and our own experiences. So we have a lot of information and experiences that we can bring to the table um, when talking about mental health with adults and professionals. Sometimes as mental health advocates, when we feel that we're the only ones speaking up, it can feel lonely. 
For others who are experiencing mental health challenges, it can also be extremely lonely. As we've been hearing from our guests, feeling alone with their problems or generally feeling lonely is a common experience of teens that contributes to mental health challenges. According to the Making Care Common Project at Harvard University's Graduate School of Education, a startling 61% of young people ages 18 to 25 reported feeling lonely frequently, almost all the time or all the time. Although this is a rising issue to this day, the power of community can work towards fostering feelings of togetherness that can help reduce isolation and loneliness. Oscar, how has being in a community of fellow mental health advocates helped empower you personally and in the work you do in the mental health space? Um, being within a community has allowed me to put myself more out there. I felt more comfortable with those people around me, but I also felt this shared sense of relatability. Uh, we were able to communicate with one another effectively. It's, it's uh, kind of amazing how back in 2023, when I felt the sense of loneliness compared to now, present day 2024, it's a really starting to change. I feel more connected with the people around me. I feel I just have a greater sense of energy within me as opposed to that feeling of loneliness I had before. And so community, community creates a sense of relatability, with, which then creates a better you, which I feel is very important. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that transition, and I'm so happy to hear that you found your community as well. Devin, can you share a little bit about the impacts of community in your work? How has that helped you both personally and in your mental health advocacy? Yeah, so it's definitely helped destigmatize it within myself, right? Like I, before going into Hope Squad, I wasn't, I, I felt the stigma around mental health as well, and it's helped kind of bring it down for me. And it's also helped me on a personal level, uh, knowing that I have a community of peers who I can talk to if I'm ever struggling. And it's, it's really comforting knowing that there are people who are my age, my friends who have the same uh, mental health education as me, whom I can go to if I need to. Thank you so much for sharing that. I can definitely relate to what you're talking about. In my mental health organization, Unite, we bring a couple of youth across the world internationally. And it's so beautiful to see how even outside of our state, of our country and, and beyond into the world, this is such a common issue. It really is a universal thread that weaves through all of our experiences. Marley, can you tell me a little bit about your understanding of community and how it's affected your work both personally and in your involvement um, with mental health? Personally, I feel like it's the most empowering thing there is having a community, especially of teens who all share the same passion for mental health. And it's definitely inspired me to share my thoughts on the topic of mental health and to collaboratively discuss solutions with a group of people so that it can be made possible. I think also when working with a group, the probability of a solution actually occurring is like spiked. It definitely rises when there's more people that are involved because going to one person and saying, hey, I'm struggling with my mental health. I think we should add a wellness center to school. Isn't as effective as 50 students going to a school board and expressing the need for it. There's definitely power in numbers. So being able to have the opportunity to speak collaboratively and to share my thoughts with peers is so empowering and definitely brings change to the mental health community. Thank you so much for sharing that, Marley. It sounds like community has had a really significant positive impact on your mental health work. I think as we're witnessing today in this conversation about mental health, this topic is affecting youth both in this setting, in this conversation in California and beyond that worldwide. But ultimately, the reality of it is we're coming together around a shared issue, and that's the youth mental health crisis, which the effects of this we're still seeing to this day. According to the CDC, in the past years, more than four in 10 students have felt persistently sad 
or hopeless, and nearly one-third experienced poor mental health. While this can feel like a daunting issue, we as teen advocates do have the power to make change through education and peer support. For example, at my mental health organization, UNITE, enhancing mental health education is a pillar of our work. As youth, we're not mental health professionals and we can't provide professional psychological support, but we can take action towards increasing mental health education, awareness, and advocacy. Education can also play an important role in combating the mental health crisis. All of our guests today are involved in different ways of providing mental health education, from the most micro scale of just being there and being ready to listen some, to someone, to the working on the more macro scale of giving mental health presentations to classrooms and then on up to advising districts and county school boards. Melissa, you're in a really unique position to provide a supportive space for your peers to gather and enhance their understanding of mental health through the Positive Mental Health Club you formed at your school. This work highlights a powerful combination of peer-to-peer -peer mental health education and support. How have you personally taken steps to ensure that this space remains safe and judgment-free for your peers to openly discuss mental health topics? Sure. So um, I'm really happy that I created my club. It's always been something on my mind to do, but I never really had the confidence to do it um, until one of my teachers stepped up and really helped me create it and gather the people for it. What we did in my club was we met every Friday and we always uh, started off with talking about our week, how it went, so we could just get everybody comfortable talking. And we just established that we can't necessarily say anything too extreme because we don't want to trigger anybody in the group uh, but, but we've established that we're all okay with talking about you know what we went through and if we have any struggles and because it's kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer support everybody just kind of pitches in it's just like you know man I I feel the same way or it just makes you feel really human honestly <laughs> it makes you feel like you know what they're they're going through this too the weight of the world is not on my shoulders like there's other people in this exact room right now that are going through the, almost exactly the same thing or similar so it really helps people out um, and I also got in contact with my uh, school counselors to also come in sometimes and offer some advice along with the teachings that I did which is not professional at all I just kind of googled like how to reduce anxiety and I tried to do the best that I can to present it to people and just hear how they do it as well so we're all just kind of learning from each other, which is, I think, really beautiful because, you know, one night person might know one thing and the other pitches in. So it's really a, a community of people where we all just kind of help each other out. That's great. It sounds like it's less about finding a solution or an answer and more about just being there together and, and listening and understanding each other. This is State of Mind, Being Human and Living Well. In case you're just joining us, I'm your guest host, Niku Sederat, and we're talking with four passionate teen mental health advocates about the many different ways teens can help combat the growing mental health crisis and be a support for their fellow peers. With me for this conversation are Marley Miller from Salinas High, Melissa Macias from North Monterey High School, Oscar Alvarez Delgado from Pajaro Valley High School, and Devin Bloom from Scotts Valley High. Every State of Mind episode has a resource list, and the resources we talk about today and more can be found in the show notes for this episode. You can also listen or subscribe to our podcasts on all the major podcasting sites and on your home smart speaker. Show notes, resources, our podcasts, and where to subscribe to them can be found at www.stateofmindmedia.org. Back to our interview.
Marley, you were also involved in mental health education by providing mental health presentations to classes at your school. What kinds of education do you offer in those presentations you give to high school classes? And what have you seen to be helpful in the types of mental health education for teens? In these presentations, I'm able to provide statistics that were recorded from our AIM surveys that we do regarding how teens are impacted, as well as in what category of mental health that they're specifically struggling with. So this say, even if no one in the class that I'm presenting to wants to ask direct questions in front of the entire class or come over and talk to me after the presentation's over, they still know that they're not alone and have a sense of, hey, this person or the 300 people that were surveyed out of all of them, every single person had something going on, just lets them know that they're not alone. And then I also include information at the end of all my presentations about resources that are available, such as like phone numbers, and then just other outlets and positive things that they could be doing so that even if they want to act like they weren't engaged or act like they weren't listening, they still pick up positives from presentations. And it helps to let them know, hey, I'm not alone. I'm seen, even if they don't want to voice their concerns themselves. That's really wonderful. As peers, youth, and adults, we must understand that being mental health advocates is not synonymous with providing psychological support. Unless we are mental health professionals, it's critical for us to refrain from providing advice, but instead we need to cultivate active listening skills, empathy, and compassion. However, this is not as easy as it may seem. Devin, do you have any tips for our listeners to channel these skills? Yeah, so obviously you want to be very engaged with whoever you're talking to. Like if it's someone important to you, you have to make sure and be engaged. And a lot of the times people aren't always ready to just sit down and write out, talk with, to you about what they're struggling with. But a lot of the times you can pick up on little hints and stuff. Like when someone is really struggling, especially they'll hint at how they're feeling or they'll they'll touch on it briefly. But not try to make it an obvious part of the conversation. And if you can, you know, kind of, I, I, for lack of a better word, kind of prod at that and be like, are you really feeling down in this way? Or is this affecting you? Like, just make sure that they're doing all right. Because a lot of the times when people are struggling, they'll, like I said, they'll hint and you can, you can help them. You just have to be really paying attention. Marley, you have a lot of power in driving the efficacy of mental health education and peer support, both virtually and in person. Can you briefly touch on why it's so important for youth to lead these types of messaging regarding youth mental health? Definitely. So for me, I think that it's important for youth to lead this type of messaging because there's a lot of shared experience that comes with mental health and all of us have our own stories and our own anecdotes that we could share and are all able to understand a lot of every aspect of crisis since we all have our own little things. So if I've been through something and a peer has been through something, we can help to similarly connect with these issues and be able to bring them forwards showing this is how it can be presented in my case and this is how it can be presented in my peers case with our age we all are really like close in struggle so we all have a lot of the same I struggle with my AP classes I struggle with balancing academics and sports and with our age being so close we also find a lack of judgment as opposed to what may come from a adults or guardian figures in our lives having someone that's my age I'm just much more likely to open up and confide in them rather because I'm not scared of the judgment from an older person. Melissa can you also share a little bit about what is super important about youth and, and them taking the action steering the wheel and leading these types of conversations about mental health education and peer support? Uh, I think it's really important because like I spoke about earlier, it's that different type of voice, that different type of representation that people need. You know, we relied on adults for so many years to establish these wellness centers for us, these councils for us. But it's clearly shown that we're still struggling and even more with newer issues that adults are not necessarily um, informed on. 
you know, they had issues that they were able to deal with kids from the past. But now since we're a newer generation and, and we're still stuck with a little bit like older generated uh, counselors, the level of understanding is not there at all. Um, they could try to sometimes, you know, just being an, an open ear really helps some people, but others do need that guidance and that advice. So youth being the ones to speak about the fact that, hey, this is what we need. This is what we're going through to youth sometimes. So a phone is kind of silly, but maybe it's the biggest struggle of mine, you know, comparing myself to other people on social media, um, new struggles that older generations just wouldn't understand. So youth being involved would really, really be the voice of the newer issues that they should be aware of. Oscar, moving on to you, I'm wondering, do you think that both virtual and in-person mental health education and support is more effective when youth talk about it? And can you tell me a little bit about the types of messaging that you think are most crucial when having these conversations? I think 100% that it is better if a youth leads these messaging youth to youth contact is 100% important it, like having youth be the be the voice allows for fresher sp- perspectives as opposed to old generation perspectives that you know are you know in a way old it's just it's not the present that it is now they lived in a time where they didn't have the same technology that we may have now where social media is such a big part of of our lives it's it drives us sometimes you know so i think it 100 percent uh having you be able to lead us is is what is our only way of moving forward at this point as well as you know creating that sense of, rel- of relatability is 100 percent important as well you know we can share our common struggles academically but as well as personally Yeah, that's totally right. Mental health is an evolving issue and we must adapt and youth are very adaptable. So it's important for them to lead those conversations. So at my mental health organization, Unite, our motto is mental health for the youth by the youth. And this youth driven approach has proven effective for us, not only enhancing youth participation in the US, but also on a global scale. It's allowed us to reach youth across 23 different countries. Free crisis and supportive and educational mental health resources can be found at our website www.uniteyouthmentalhealth.com. Marley, are there any resources that you'd want to share with our listeners that you think would be beneficial? I always offer AIM as a resource because me personally feel like it's definitely helps me just better understand mental health at its base level and just recognize that I'm not alone. And it's also really beneficial because on the plus side, you get community service hours. So you get to learn more about mental health and increase your community service. And then I also really like this app. It's called I Am and it's daily positive affirmations as frequently as you'd like. So you set the app up and say, I want a notification three times a day or as frequently as you'd like. And then you can also pick the timing and it's just nice little uplifting reminders that you get like a text message or you can just go on the app and scroll through all the positive quotes. I think it's really uplifting. That's wonderful. Melissa, what about you? Do you have any resources that you'd like to share? Definitely, yeah. So I, just like Marley said, I definitely do recommend AIM. They're an amazing organization that works with youth. I also do recommend Safe Space. They're another organization that sometimes work, works both at the state and national level. For resources, I mean, just go to your local friend as well. I know that sounds a little weird. They can be sometimes the best resource for you to to vent and to find comfort in. But yeah. Oscar, do you have any resources for mental health that you'd like to share with us today? I think something important for me, at least, that I do on the daily usually is um, journaling. It's a way for me to you know, keep in check with myself, see how I'm doing mentally, see what I did throughout the day. And something else, it's a, it's a, mainly for adults, but it's a youth mental health first aid course. It's given by the Santa Cruz County Office of Education, and it helps equip, equip adults with proper tools to help students with experiencing mental health crisis. 
So it allows for adults to aid uh, students. Devin, last but not least, do you have any mental health resources that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, so in terms of um, educating yourself or others, um, I've actually learned a lot from uh, psychlearningcurve.org. I find it's actually a pretty good website with um, a lot of uh, reliable information, and good studies and stuff like that. And also like Oscar, I think journaling is extremely valuable. I was, um, I was in kind of a rough spot last year and a friend of mine was like, you should, you should try journaling. And I tried it and it was actually really nice. It makes you, it, if you have, um, it helps you organize your thoughts. Like of, it helps you like put on paper, like what's making you feel down and what, what you can do to help with that. It just helped because sometimes you can feel very cluttered and stuff like that. And also um, it just helps you, it like validates how you feel when you just put it down and like, it makes you feel more like a person. It makes you feel very real. And that's, it's a really nice feeling. And it helped me a lot when I was in that situation. Now, Melissa, given all that you've learned about being a youth mental health advocate, what's something you wish you'd known or understood about mental health earlier in your journey? Sure. I wish that I knew that I am not just a number, which sounds kind of weird, but when I first tried to get help for my mental health, I was pretty much kind of thrown to the the corner because I'm not somebody that comes from money, nor do you really see my family, uh, my kind of background, get help at all. You know, I remember when I was first getting help, I kind of felt like, man, what am I doing? Like, none of my families have ever done this. I feel like they're going to, like, look down on me. But, you know, I'm just, I'm not just another number. I'm a person that should receive help, even if I don't have the money for it or if I don't have the resources for it. So... I know that it's hard to sometimes just kind of see yourself as just another issue when in reality it's like you're a person and like you got to take care of yourself in order to take others as well. Oscar, now moving on to you, what's something that you wish you could have known or um, understood a little bit earlier in your mental health advocacy journey? Um, I think something that I wish I knew earlier is just how different the scale is in mental health, how really like it can be extremely visible, but also very minor. It's it's honestly astonishing when you really see it and pay attention to the body language of your peers and how, you know, how a little act they do really just shows you, you know, they're going through something too. So I think definitely just the range of mental health and how it can be big, but it could also be very minor. Today, we've talked to four advocates about their work in the mental health space, ranging from countywide advocacy to work in the school setting. All of these forms of advocacy, both macro and micro, are equally important. I encourage all of our listeners to step into the role of mental health advocate in your direct communities. And remember, this can be as simple as checking in with a friend or starting a conversation about mental health. Amid the youth mental health crisis, we've witnessed a handful of youth who are taking powerful steps toward enhancing the mental well-being of their own respective communities. However, becoming a mental health advocate does not have to entail making drastic changes. I encourage you to also take on the role of a mental health advocate, whether that's by starting a conversation about mental health with your peers or volunteering at a youth-based mental health organization like UNITE. Taking small steps toward educating yourself and others about mental health and opening compassionate, stigma-free conversations are all tremendous steps you can personally take toward cultivating resilient communities that are grounded on the foundations of mental well-being. While we still have significant work to do in completely combating mental health stigma, we do encourage you to seek out support whenever you or a loved one are struggling. Because, as you've heard from our guests today, when you reach out, it does get better.
been listening to State of Mind. Being Being human human and living well. 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 I want to say a huge thank you to our guest host today, Niku Sederat, to all our guests, Marley Miller, Oscar Alvarez, Delgado, Melissa Macias, and Devin Bloom. And thanks to you for joining us. Be sure to check out the wealth of information included on the resource list in the show notes for this episode. If you missed part of this episode, or you just want to hear it again, subscribe to our podcast on all the major podcast platforms. Also, when you rate and review our podcast, you do help it get found and heard by more listeners. So if you like this one or any of our episodes, could you please do that for us? Special thanks to Jeannie Baldzikowski for audio production, and thanks to acoustic guitarist Adrian Legg for composing, performing, and donating the use of our theme music. State of Mind was developed and originally broadcast in association with KSQD-FM in Santa Cruz, California. We always want to hear from listeners and community members just like you, and we especially would love to hear from any of you teen listeners. So you can submit your very own In Your Voice recording and become part of the conversation by either calling in to leave a message or recording an audio file right on your phone. Either way, could you tell us about a mental health experience you've had, something that's contributed to your mental health recovery? Perhaps you want to suggest a topic, or maybe you want to share a resource that's been helpful to you. We really do want to hear from you, and your voice may well be on one of our future shows. Submission details can be found at www.stateofmindmedia.org. Come on back and join us again next month for a whole new episode of State of Mind. Until then, live well. 